Welcome to today's culinary seminar, Delivering Flavor to Drive Sales. My name is Chef Nick Conring, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to provide you with our latest research findings applicable for menus of today. So let's get started. As we look at our very simple agenda, the focus of the seminar today is to really pick up where we left off. We will quickly discuss our continued research process, followed by a recap of the trends we identified pre-COVID, and then finally provide you with the freshest insights from our street level research conducted just a few months ago. The pandemic forced our research to take a hiatus this last past year, but thankfully, as vaccination rates climbed, restrictions on restaurants started to loosen. This allowed us to partake in our official 19th year conducting our proprietary external research. Just like in previous years, our focus has been on the three largest trend driving cities in the US, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. These cities incubate the ideas where trends start and influence chefs around the country. We seek out newly opened restaurants here because in our experience, they're the ones that drive innovation amongst stiff competition. Let's look further at our process. The vast majority of the year, we are carefully examining publications, digital newspapers, magazines, journals, and blogs that call it new restaurant openings. Our process surely isn't scientific, but we simply notate these restaurants and track their progress throughout the year. This becomes our target list. As we approach our annual research, we vet these targets out by visiting their websites, studying their menus, and looking at their social pages. The goal here is to whittle our target list down to 40 confirmed restaurants per city, and then we get into the logistical preparations. Thereafter, it becomes increasingly challenging to logistically set up the research in each city to accomplish visiting 40 restaurants in just five working days. COVID certainly made our research preparations more challenging this year as we navigated all the changes in real time. As we finalize the list of locations that we want to research, we plan logistics. We map out locations, factor in travel time, reservations, Uber rides, walking distance, and so on to ensure our days are successful. Upon visiting these locations, we scan every menu as the menus online don't always match what's available in person. We professionally photo each plate of food that we order and we take a copious amount of notes after tasting each dish. Additionally, we talk to anyone and everyone who's willing to talk with us about their menu, concept, and brand for us to further understand their cuisine. The photos that are in this presentation are all from our research tours. As you might recall, prior to COVID, in Chicago, we visited 39 restaurants and tasted 362 dishes. Similarly, in New York, we tasted 440 dishes at 41 restaurants. And finally, in LA, we tasted 384 dishes at 35 restaurants. After our research has concluded between all three cities, we take it back to our home office and try to decipher what it all means. We look for patterns between East Coast, West Coast, and in between, and every year we discover something that has not been on our radar. These menu opportunities are what we take a position on from a culinary perspective. Once we have highlighted our discoveries, we begin creating resources to complement our findings. Every year we standardize over 200 kitchen tested recipes based on our proprietary research that is housed in a web-based system for our sales and marketing teams to utilize in consulting with our customers in commercial and non-commercial segments. Now let's look at the trends pre-COVID. So in pre-COVID times, if you look at the screen, what you're seeing here are all the different trends that we had highlighted in previous seminars. You have anchovies and bone broths, conservas, Filipino cuisine, different global influences, right? A lot of different great trends that we had highlighted that we talked to in previous sessions. And now we're gonna look at really the, the new trends and see where they kind of line up with pre-COVID times. What crossed over, what fell off, what things are important today versus previously. So post-pandemic, right, we're looking at the restaurants here that we saw on our latest research coming off of Chicago, some great restaurants and some exciting stuff that we took back with us. And in Chicago, we visited 32 restaurants and tasted 279 dishes just at the very end of this last past May. And I have to tell you, it was a breath of fresh air being able to get out and do research again. And as we move forward here, getting out of this pandemic, we're really looking forward to being able to continue on to New York and LA and bring more insights to the table. But post-pandemic, these are the things that you're looking at that we're really highlighting in our uh, presentation today. So we're talking a lot about Mediterranean influences, terra masalata, Baltic bread boats, meze, for example, 
And then we're gonna look at some crossover, right? We've got Filipino cuisine still coming forward. We've got vegetable centricity that is not going away. And handhelds are still bleeding over to post-pandemic times coming into to COVID, right? All that portability aspect is still very relevant here. And then we'll talk about savory pastries of all things. So the first thing we're gonna get into is Mediterranean cuisine. And I think from a geographical sense, it's really important to look at a map and realize what Mediterranean is and what, what influences are around it, right? So here's the Mediterranean Sea. And there's really 20 countries that touch the sea with different global influences. And I think it's a really good visual to, to, to understand. So here, what we realized after research, and this was not on purpose or intentional, there was nine different places that we stopped at uh, on our research in Chicago that were all Mediterranean influenced. So what I did here is highlight those restaurants, put their cuisine uh, at four where the countries are around the Mediterranean Sea. So you can get a better understanding of what we saw, what we tasted, and the different influences in global regions that really cross over here, right? So we have Croatia, Greece, Israel, and so on. There's a lot of different flavors, a lot of different aspects of their cuisines that bleed all together coming around the Mediterranean Sea. So the first thing we'll talk about is modern meze. So meze here uh, in today's time being very modern, they're using traditional ingredients, but there's modern interpretations to their approach of creating these things. And I think from a, a menu building perspective, as we try to bring check averages up, I'll talk about this kind of side hustle. And what I mean by that is really using your sides to your advantage. So meze, appetizers, shared plates, snacks, your sides can bundle up into this category and you know, bring that check average up. Beyond hummus, hummus I think a lot of people automatically gravitate towards Mediterranean cuisine, but it's so much more evolved than that. So we'll, talk, we'll take a look at some shared ideas that are gonna be ripe for your menus that are not maybe as tired as a hummus that we've seen for multiple years. And then we'll get into vegetable centricity and meat-based meat -based dishes and seafood dishes that all revolve around meze. And of course, the good thing about meze is there's great health benefits to it, right? There's a Mediterranean diet, there's influence there in the background that consumers are gravitating towards. And I think it's really important. And like we showed you on the map, there's so many cuisines that revolve around the Mediterranean basin. So it's a very broad perspective of flavors that you get out of Mediterranean cuisine. You've got Basque influence and tapas from Spain. You've got Greece, Middle Eastern, Balkan, right? All these wonderful influences that really shape what meze is. So the first thing we'll talk about under kind of this meze umbrella is vegetable centricity. And here I'm calling it out is anything from full flora to protein pinches, right? So vegetables are the center of attention here. And it doesn't matter if there's proteins on here or not, that's what we're calling out. We're not calling out uh, faux proteins or proteins that have been created in a laboratory. Uh, we're talking about things here that are really specific to be vegetable based dishes and some might have meat inclusion, some might not. And that kind of is the, uh, the whole approach to encapsulate what consumers are looking for. They want that healthy kind of inspired dish. They want really flavorful forward dishes as well. And it's gonna be kind of flexitarian in influence, but it's gonna meet all the demands I think that people are looking for today. And obviously with vegetable based dishes, it's highly profitable. Consumers do not know really how to cook vegetables really well. And you go to the, the grocery store, you go to markets, there's a lot of wonderful produce there, but when they take it back home, they don't really know what to do with it. And so I think that's where the profitability lies for you at an operator level, is to be able to create something delicious. And you know, obviously the consumer can't make that at home, so you can make good margins on that particular dish. And lastly, the differentiation piece I think is super huge. It, you know, if you, if you have an impossible burger on your menu, try to take a look at you know, doing vegetables differently, and that will drive the differentiation from your neighboring restaurants that are by you. Uh, so, you know, keep your competition at bay and look at vegetables to kind of enrich your menu. So this first dish is from Rosemary in Chicago. These are a dish of grilled radishes. And as you, as you see here, it's a beautiful dish, right? You know, wonderful visual pr presentation. You see the radishes on here. Uh, on top though, what they're adding is a little bit of white fresh roe, some local roe, so domestic roe. Uh, for a little bit of salinity and a, and a pop and vibrancy, add some texture to it as well. And then there's just a little bit of fennel pollen and uh, some chives for garnish. And Rosemary, if you're not familiar in Chicago, uh, was probably one of the most anticipated restaurants that had opened up this last past year. And that was from 
uh, Chef Joe Flom here, uh, and if you're familiar with him, he won Top Chef back in 2018. Uh, he's a Spiaggia alumni under Tony Machuano, so he had a lot of clout coming into opening up his first restaurant. And uh, you know, it was really hard to get reservations. And as, as a matter of fact, we stood outside on a Monday at 4.30 when they opened at five just to get bar seats because we couldn't get a reservation. So we were able to slide in under the radar to be able to do our research there. And then additionally at Rosemary, here you see their prosciutto dish. So he's got peas and fava beans, pecorino, ricotta, and it's just a wonderful, bright, kind of spring, summer dish. And really what kind of drives us home is the prosciutto that's here, right? So you get the salinity, you get that wonderful umami presence from that dried cured ham. And that's really important to kind of go along with all these vegetables that are on this plate. Next dish at Rosemary was the Pinzimonio salad. And Pinzimonio was a dish that we saw a couple different times in iterations throughout Chicago on our research. But really Pinzimonio is almost like a, a crudite style salad. So raw vegetables, but in this case, they shave them really thin. And then classically, it's either an emulsion with olive oil or an olive oil dipping sauce. But here, what we saw in research a couple of different ways was bagnacotta. And bagnacotta, if you're not familiar with that, is that anchovy-based emulsion with olive oil and garlic. And here they're doing it more of like a green goddess style, adding some fresh herbs into that emulsion, uh, giving it more depth of flavor and uh, wonderful color as well. So here's that second example of Pinzimonio salad. This is an Apollonia in the south side of Chicago, uh, the South Loop. And um, here you've got bagnacotta down uh, underneath all these wonderful shaved vegetables. And then uh, Chef here is using lardo, so your cured fat back um, from pork that uh, really just kind of drapes over vegetables that adds that salinity and uh, adds more uh, depth of flavor to round out this dish. At Chichio Mio, this particular dish is also on that veg-centric kind of meze, right? So this is a stuffed artichoke. And what you're getting here from that umami forward balance of uh, the protein inclusions are, as you see in the bottom right, conservas and anchovies. And if you're not familiar with tonado, tonado is really another emulsion that adds in uh, tuna conserva and a little bit of anchovy into that emulsion with lemon juice uh, and sometimes even just mayonnaise to, to round it out to give it more body. But that's for your dipping sauce here on the side. At Baravac, a wonderful kind of Spanish uh, tapas influence uh, based restaurant. Here they have posted asparagus and that, uh, that inclusion of protein here is that trout roe on top. Again, adding that salinity, that pop of color um, a little bit of texture difference to go along with the asparagus. And then Andros Taverna, here he's got a wonderful dish of artichokes and they're just bathed in that chicken stock. So something really simple to add that, that influence, that meat inclusion is really coming from this broth. And that's what the artichokes are cooked in, that's what they're served in. And so it kind of concentrates and gets fortified as you cook it as well. Great flavor there. And then back at Apollonia, this is their tart forestier. So something super simple, you've got fontina cheese and mushrooms that's baked on this kind of pastry crust. And then on top of it, you've got that wonderful yolk just sitting there that's ready to be broken into you and kind of slathered on top of the tart. And it's a wonderful way to share. And then another egg inclusion here uh, at Orkin Roy in Chicago, Scandinavian style restaurant, you have a smoked trout salad. So you've got little bits of smoked trout there uh, kind of woven through this salad to give you that protein balance. Uh, but then you've got that yolk that's been, uh, that's obviously popped here for the photo, but it's a poached egg. And that doubles as kind of a secondary sauce with the dressing and uh, adds just more, you know, way more flavor and way more viscosity to that kind of dressing. And it's just a wonderful dish. And then back at Rosemary. So these dishes are not with protein inclusions, but they are you know, really just focused on those vegetables. So cold roasted beets, cold roasting, uh, fire roasting. Uh, we saw a tremendous amount of that on research this last past year. And here they're doing it with the beets. Uh, at the four, they've got cashmac underneath the beets. Cashmac is more of like a Serbian soft cheese spread and pistachios for, for garnish and texture. Wonderful dish there. And then also at Rosemary, this is their stracciatella salad. And here they've got stracciatella cheese that's kind of flattened uh, underneath the, the wonderful strawberries. You've got basil and balsamic vinegar uh, over the top, a little bit of olive oil to finish that dish. Just very wonderful, very bright. And then back at Apollonia, this is their black truffle puff bread. So something where they take a sourdough starter, they bake it slightly and then shallow fry the bottom so it gets really, really crispy, crusty. And here they have wonderful amounts of uh, Parmesan cheese and shaved black truffles over the top with some fried parsley. Just a great avenue for sharing, breaking bread together, uh, wonderful flavors. 
And then also at Apollonia, this is their cauliflower caponato. So caponata, more of that kind of style stewed relish. Here they're kind of playing into that space with golden raisins, capers, and some chive oil. And then back at Baravec, little gem lettuce. Uh, that's been huge for the last year or so, kind of your Boston bib and romaine hybrid. And here they're just using that for their salad with roasted shallots, some Marcona almonds for texture, and some aged sheep cheese for uh, flavor as well. And then at Mamadilia in Chicago, wonderful Spanish tapas restaurant. Um, here they have Brussels sprouts as that vegetable that's kind of hiding underneath all those wonderful garnishes. But really they've got the romesco sauce down first and then the Brussels sprouts on top. Uh, wonderful cheese that's uh, actually smoked there for more flavor profile and then some garnishes, but that's a great dish there. And then Andros Taverna, here's like one of their sides, that side hustle piece, right? Uh, these are just potatoes on their menu, but they're doing it in Hasselback style. They're slicing it super thin um, and kind of uh, butterflying all the way down to the ends and not cutting all the way through, but as they bake, right, they kind of open up and give that Hasselback style cut. And here it's just simply served with olive oil and uh, Greek oregano, uh, very wonderful dish. And then Fia, this kind of modern Israeli restaurant, a lot of places that were offering meze would have some sort of like meze collection. And here this is kind of an assortment of what they have here. So you see all the wonderful ingredients, all kind of vegetable based, spice roasted cauliflower, uh, they've got a corn relish, some eggplant, tahina, uh, zatar seasoning on their pita, they've got olives, wonderful spread just to kind of share, also kind of use as a spacer between courses. And then onto the next kind of focus for this vegetable centricity mezzi that we're talking about. And this is more of an ingredient that we've seen the last probably three or four years, and it's really kind of coming out, uh, coming into the force. This is something to be on your radar with, and it's something obviously to have differentiation for you being kind of new to this kind of unearthing of vegetable centricity and umami-based ingredients, and that is terra masalata. And uh, terra masalata starts with tarama, and tarama is really just a cod roe that's been salted and cured, and in this case, it is whipped and emulsified, and that's really how you make terra masalata. And so as you see here, it's just, as it's described, you've got either breadcrumbs or potato puree to really give it that body, and then um, olive oil to emulsify it, and lemon and onion. Really, really simple as far as what the ingredients are, but that background of that salted, dry cured cod roe uh, gives it wonderful umami presence. It's a lot like your beignicata. It's a lot like tanato that we talked about earlier. So this is one of those newer things to keep a focus on because I think it's going to elevate a lot of vegetables and use it in your arsenal throughout your menu. And in different cuisines in Scandinavian countries, um, as you see here from this Kalas brand uh, terra masalata, I mean that's what they serve kids at, at daycare on uh, rye bread toast. You know, growing up, uh, wonderful cultures use this uh, in a lot of different ways. So we're starting to see it bleed into. Uh, wonderful spaces like Mediterranean influence today. And we'll look at some examples to kind of drive that home. So at Andros Taverna, this is their Meze collection like I talked about before. And you see a, a lot of different things on this plate here. That You've got um, a, a fava bean puree. Uh, you've got terra masalata, which is the bottom, very bottom one with the road that you see on top. And then you see all their skewers, their kalamaki. Uh, wonderful plate. But again, just to highlight the terra masalata on here as a shareable, something you could rip some naan bread into and, and kind of you know, spoon that over your, your naan bread or whatever you're eating. And then going into uh, Abley Taverna in Chicago, this is their tasting plate, so kind of another meze collection. Uh, on the left-hand side, that's where you have the terra masalata. And then you see your kind of, you know, your more natural things you'd expect from a tasting plate of a Mediterranean influence, tzatziki, you've got your spicy feta spread and hummus, right? But this kind of breaks that up, makes it more modern, makes it interesting, something that people would like to try. And then here's some previous examples from research uh, outside of this last past year. So this is Savita in New York, and this is just one of their sides of terra masalata. So here they're actually using salted dry cured cod, uh, actually not the roe, so it's almost like a brandad if you're familiar with that. And they blend it with olive oil, uh, lemon, and potatoes to really make it the, the viscous quality they're looking for. And then they garnish it with tobiko on top uh, for some texture and some more salinity there. And then back in New York as well, this is Celestine, this is in Brooklyn. So here they're using the terra masalata as a dressing or a salad dressing for their shikari salad. So an easy way to introduce terra masalata uh, on your menu with that. And then also in New York, this is Simon and the Whale. So here they just have a, a dish of black bread for sharing. 
Uh, they've got a schmear of kelp butter in the back, but that ramekin there is really that terra masalata, so ripping off that bread, getting some butter, getting some terra masalata. That umami presence from the, the dry cured cod roe really resonates in that dressing and just gives it so much more flavor, especially with the kelp in the background, goes side by side. And then Restaurant Sira in Chicago, uh, this is Chef Chris Pandel's concoction here, but he's doing a play on terra masalata, that's why it's in quotes. So instead of using that dry cured cod roe, he's using smoked mackerel or a conserva really to use that emulsion, use it for that emulsion with potatoes and um, wonderful dish there with a little bit of roe on top to finish the dish. And then lastly, here's another example in New York. This is La Mercerie, a wonderful French restaurant. And here, Terra Masalata, certainly not French, but coming into influence here to, to bring to attention with their blinis. And just the, that crock in the back is filled with it. You've got a little lemon cheek on the side there, and then obviously some more roe to add on top of those blinis to share. Just a great dish. And then we'll get into some more meze that is protein focused, right? Not just uh, vegetables uh, and everything else like we talked about previously. But this is a wonderful dish at Apollonia. So this is toothpick lamb, typically a Szechuan dish, uh, taking just small amounts of meat, toothpicking it, uh, being able to quickly saute it. The toothpicks allow it to not stick together, which is important to get that caramelization. And uh, obviously this is in Szechuan, so they're using more Mediterranean Greek, st Greek style influence to play off of what toothpick lamb is. And then also at Apollonia, a wonderful little muscle toast here. Right, so taking that um, thick cut toast with uh, roasted mussels on top, um, pan con tomate is obviously a Spanish play here, and then they've got the Calabrian butter in the back and that beaker that you pour over to sauce the toast. And then I talked about Brandad previously a little bit when we were talking about terra masalata, but here's an example of Brandad at Bar Vec, more in that Spanish style. So um, that emulsified or whipped together uh, potato and um, the salted cod into this dish in a hot crock, just with some crust, uh, some crostinis on the side to dip in or to be able to spoon out, and a wonderful shareable there as well. And then at Mamadilia, back at Mamadilia, a uh, Spanish place. So here's another brand out example using mackerel, so a little bit different there. Um, and then making it a little bit more modern, I think, with, with blistered shishito peppers in the background, which I think is a nice touch. And then also a bar of vac, um, I really liked how they did this dish here and how it kind of bleeds into Mediterranean influence because they're taking something like this wild halibut, uh, but their salsa verde is not uh, what you would think of it, right? It's made with actually green charred olives and fava beans, and I think that has just a wonderful, uh, refreshing take on what salsa verde usually would be. And then at Mamadilia, you know, we talked about conservas previously in the past, so I wanted to highlight it again here. Just a really simple way to have a meze, something that doesn't require any labor, just opening up, you know, a really nice can of preserved uh, seafood, in this case it's tuna belly, and having some uh, toast or crusty bread on the side to share. Really quick thing to execute, get out there. Mama Delia also has this in the front of the house, uh, really just for a retail presence. So they have a whole wall of conservas. You could walk in off the street and buy it if you'd like to take it home. This is kind of like that sea crudery kind of example. Ports really well, you can make kits out of it, right? All sorts of great stuff. So I highly encourage to look at uh, conservas today. And then what they do with conservas is they also put it onto their menu in, in different places. So here are toasts, right? They've got sardines down on top of the toast with a green padron pepper sauce. And the next example we're kind of bleeding into this Mediterranean focus is what I'm calling bread boats of the Black Sea. And this was really cool. This was something that we've seen in a, probably three or four years as well. And we were just waiting for it to snowball into something that we have enough examples with, with and things that are bleeding more into the mainstream today to bring it to attention. And I think after this last research, we, we finally got enough information, we got enough examples to really bring it home. And so I'm taking you back to a map, right? So here's the Black Sea, it's right next to the Mediterranean Sea, but you see the countries that focus around that Balkan Peninsula, and that's where these bread boats really live. So different countries have different ways of presenting it, but they're all very, very similar and similar to something that you know really well. Additionally, pizza. So this first example is cachapori. And cachapori, cachapori is a Georgian dish. We're not talking about the state of Georgia here. We're talking about the country of Georgia. And this is their national dish. And really just imagine, you know, pizza dough and being able to shape it into more of a canoe style shape. So here they're kind of stretching it, elongating it, making it tapered at the ends. And they're building this canoe really just to house a whole bunch of gooey cheese. 
So you see the cheeses that they have listed here are really traditional for, for their country. And for us in the US, it'd be more like a, a blend of mozzarella and feta or even ricotta cheese together. And it's really just baked off together um, you know, in the oven. And then what it gets finished with, in most cases, is either a, a whole baked egg into the oven, keeping that yolk still kind of runny, or it just gets finished with a raw yolk on top for service with whole butter. And basically what you do there is from a service queue or even at the table if you're eating it with your friends, is to really just take like a fork and stir up the butter and that raw yolk together with the wonderful melted cheese. And then you just, you know, you share it amongst each other. Either you cut it or you can rip off pieces. And you're kind of using that, um, the melted cheese in the center is now like a vehicle of almost like a fondue, right? You're, you've got the butter in there and the egg, so it's becoming a whole different thing. And the bread is for dipping with, the, with that cheese mixture. It's just a really delicious dish. The other example that we'll talk about briefly is pide. And pide in Turkey is really just for pita. But pide and cacciapori, some people say, were around before pizza was ever created. So it's been going on for a number and number of years. But again, Turkey is on the Black Sea. So all these canoes are all falling along that coastline of the Black Sea. And here for pide's being slightly different than cacciapori's uh, really just lies in, in some ways, the crust. Some people will crimp it. Um, or uh, finish it with butter on top when it comes out of the oven. And then traditionally, if you're making it from scratch, uh, some people will actually use Greek yogurt to make the dough, the dough with it. But I think one of the interesting pieces here about pide, how it differs from cacciapori, is that the toppings here are more meat-based and focused. Cacciapori traditionally does not have proteins on top. And then for Turkey, for the country of Turkey, that is really a, a lamb-based country. But for whatever reason, pide's uh, historically there are being used with beef as a protein. So you see wonderful beef salamis and almost pepperoni style, um, you know, slices that you see on top here. And it looks really reminiscent of a pizza, right? So let's look at some examples. And I guess before we get into that, again, just another map for a ge geographical reference, right? Where are we talking about that these things lie and the examples that we saw them at? So that's just to take into reference into account. And the first example is from Fia in Chicago, that Israeli, the modern Israeli restaurant. And here they're doing a shakshuka kachapuri, and I think it's genius because when we talk about baking that egg or putting that egg on top, shakshuka for brunch, right, is that stewed tomato-based um, kind of bowl or share bowl that you would have traditionally a baked egg in. So they're kind of doing a play on that here with kachapuri, and I love the idea. So again, you've got that stewed tomato um, shakshuka down in the center of, of, the, of the canoe, and you have that egg yolk on top to be able to stir in. Additionally, another offering they have was just a lamb sausage kachapuri. And here they've got you know, a little bit of tahino over the top. They've got parsley and cilantro, some tomato, just really, really nice. And then this is Chama Mama in New York. And so when I talked about the egg yolk and the butter, kind of stirring that up table side, this is exactly what they did with us at that restaurant in New York. So it came out, they had the yolk on the top, the server came and actually mixed up the yolk and the butter. And obviously with the cheese still hot, that whole butter melted and kind of emulsified into this wonderful cheese-based sauce. And you can rip the bread and, and, and share it amongst each other. It was really, really delicious. And then uh, in Los Angeles, uh, we actually went to a place called Bon Mi that served Bon Mi sandwiches and doubled as a cachapori restaurant. So don't know how they came up with that idea as a concept, but it was wonderful. So we got Bon Mi sandwiches and cachapories while we were there. And so here are their examples from Tony Cacciapori, the brand inside that umbrella of uh, their restaurants. But this is their original, right? So you got the cheese and the butter, um, a little bit of garlic that they put down. And what I like that they were doing about these examples is they took advantage of putting things on the crust. So for here, they put sesame seeds, right? Really easy to, to put on. They do a little bit of egg wash on there with the sesame seeds before they bake it, right? It gives you a little bit more texture and some flavor profile and also just a little differentiation as well. And here they've got a black truffle cacciapori, and the outside they're putting a little bit of everything seasoning. Another great idea. And lastly, here is a bacon and scallion cacciapori. So everything's good with bacon. Uh, this is just a great shareable. I love what they did with, with these with the yolk. Again, that yolk is not baked on these examples. It's just as is. And then now we get into more of these pides, right, from Turkey. So these are more kind of elongated football-style shapes. Here you see that crimp crust again. And then they've got a bunch of halal uh, beef style sausages or uh, salamis here on this particular one. And then this was just a standalone with their sujuk, 
Um, and that's their style basically of pepperoni. It looks really like pepperoni uh, visually. And you know, for what it's worth, I think if most people would see this and you didn't tell them it was a P day, they would say it's pizza. So I think anybody doing pizza today can either do cacciapori or uh, P days on their menu. And if anything else, you know, just use the shape to your advantage. Be different about the shape of what you're, what you're doing your pizza with. So here you could do it in a canoe style shape and put all your wonderful toppings that you have already uh, in house and just make it different by, by the visual appeal that you have. And lastly, this is their Trebzone style uh, pide, and that's just a regional influence pide. So here they're doing it in a round way. So like I said, different kind of examples along that Baltic coastline, and here out of Trebzone is this circular shape. And look, it looks exactly like a pizza, right? But for them, they're, they're making a, a red pepper sauce, maybe instead of a tomato sauce as that base. And then they've got Zatar seasoning to kind of play off that Mediterranean influence. And then the yolk, it's kind of hard to tell in this, in this uh, picture, but they, they took the yolk and they actually smeared it on top of the cheese and you can see that yellow highlight there, that's all yolk. And then we talked about resources earlier, right? So what do we do with our research? We try to turn it into recipes and actionables to be able to take to you, our customers. And so here, uh, just recently we shot our cachapores that we did some recipes for. So these are just visual kind of cues to be able to look through that. And right, there wasn't a whole lot of changes or dramatic changes about what these all are, but I tried to highlight so some of the crust profile, so you've got sesame seeds, you've got everything seasoning, and then just little things to put in there um, in, on top of the cheese, whether it's pepperonis, right, to making it really kind of, you know, things that we're used to, are approachable, um, or just the traditional sense of what cacciapori is. Now going on to savory pastries, um, spanning all day parts. So this was really cool and really exciting in a lot of ways because I think it was a refreshing way to, to look at pastries and it was just by chance. We just kind of pieced this together as we saw research like we often do. But I think it was rec recognizable in a way um, pre from previous research. So Milk Bar in New York, that's what this compost cookie is that you're seeing here. This is from Christina Tosi. And if you're familiar with to Christina Tosi, um, she opened up Milk Bar way back in about 2009. And that's about the time that we actually went to her restaurant doing research, right? Seeing all these wonderful new places like we normally do. But this is the first time we had a compost cookie. And what we did back on research is we took that back to our brands team. And now we have, you know, a number of years ago, created a branded product that's very similar to what Christina Tosi's compost cookie is. So we've got pretzels and chips, um, you know, and savory ingredients that are inside this cookie. So you've got a play on you know, sweet and salty, and I think that's the whole idea. And through COVID times, I think chefs took a cue from her playbook and really capitalized on it by introducing things on their menu that were sweet and savory, because they could easily put that through their menu through all the day parts. So it doesn't have to be a, a, a brunch or a cafe item. It can double as a dessert or something savory and run it through lunchtime. So it was able to get, you know, they're able to get those check averages up through the course of the day and also just to be able to turn that inventory faster, right? So be able to create more revenue, more uh, ways to, to build up their uh, check averages as well. So this first one is Kasama in Chicago, and this is uh, more or less a Filipino concept. So here they've got ube and huckleberry that's coming into this boss cake. So that's their play on doing something more savory. And then here they have a wonderful croissant, but it's not you know, in a sweet perspective at all. It's actually got black truffle on the top, and then inside of it, They've got a, a wonderful uh, black truffle cream that's inside there with a little bit of honey drizzled over the top. So really, really delicious. And then also a Kasama. Here they're doing a Danish, but this is super savory, right? Inside they have melted raclette cheese. And then over the top they have shaved serrano ham that's slightly crisped up. So that, that sweet and that savory, salty kind of all coming together here. And as you see, it's got a little bit of black pepper caramel glaze that's being kind of glued together with, uh, with the, the shaved ham. And then Lost Larson in Chicago, they opened up their, their second location, and this is from the, the wonderful pastry chef uh, that was previously at Grace. And here we just kind of stacked everything up for a visual, but we'll get into each component differently. But this is more or less a Swedish or Scandinavian style uh, bakery concept. And here they're doing things like, again, a ham and cheese croissant but they're using smoke and goose ham from Indianapolis. Uh, they've got wonderful aged cheddar in there. And then uh, more on that Scandinavian focus, here they're doing a rye and cherry scone. So, you know, with little bits of almond in there, but I, the, the focus here is to be slightly different on that savory side. And I think they really did a wonderful job, especially with their brand. And then here they're using spelt flour to make their cookies. So again, more of that Scandinavian influence. 
And then at Minahaza, um, this is more of an Indonesian style place, but here they're using ube again to make their, their sugar cookies. And you see how wonderful that they look being that really bright purple. And then at Sugar Goat uh, in Chicago, this is Stephanie Eisard's newest, uh, newest place that she had opened. And this is solely focused on you know, doing pastries and a lot of the stuff that she's been doing is on the super savory side. So really calling that into attention. So she made a Cheez-It cupcake and ironically for um, the Kellogg's company, I think it was for their 100th uh, anniversary, they had her make a Cheez-It cake, uh, similar to how she's doing these cupcakes here. But so uh, what I love about what she's doing is it takes you back to your childhood in a lot of ways because she's pulling at the hard strings of your comfort, especially during times of COVID, right? People love this. And she's using strawberry Nesquik to make her buttercream frosting on top. And then she's got ground Cheez-Its in her cupcake. I mean, just super interesting, super delicious, unique. The differentiation is there. Uh, sweet and savory is there as well. And then similarly, this is her breakfast in Lima. So here's a plantain cake base. She's got coffee in there in the buttercream, chocolate ganache, right? Sweet and savory as well. And then this is her strawberry tahini cupcake. So she's got um, tahini in the cupcake as a base. And then she uses the tahini for a buttercream frosting on top. She's got uh, strawberry Nesquik crumbles. Uh, just a wonderful way to, to make a unique cupcake. And then the last example from her, here's a blueberry brown butter muffin. So, so she's got a, a graham cake, blueberry jam in there, uh, a blueberry gastrique, so adding some more of that kind of vinegar or acid base to, uh, to that style kind of a sauce that's in there. And then on top, she's got a shortbread crumble for texture. And then I threw this out here uh, from Wake and Bacon in Chicago. This is what they're calling a quesadilla. I had never had something like this before, but it was really, really great. And so as it describes, this is a Salvadorian kind of style of pound cake made with you know, corn flour or cornmeal. And it is really, really soft with the texture and the bite here. So it's not like cornbread at all. Uh, it was just super delicious. And then going on to more global influence, uh, we had talked about it in pre-pandemic times. We're talking about it today because Filipino is truly hitting its stride. We've seen it in a wonderful way of mashups, uh, anything from ca fast casual to fine dining and then things that are being woven through all the day parts. So breakfast, like we saw at Kasama, right, for that kind of breakfast concept or how they're doing it with their pastries even. And then you've got things that are common lines of, uh, I guess, styles that are woven through menus, right? So adobo is more of that marinade or sauce from Filipino cuisine. Calamansi is the citrus that you see here. It's kind of like a play on a tangerine, a lime, and like a Meyer lemon all coming together. And then ube, we saw a couple of previous examples of that, that purple sweet potato. And then things like proteins, longanisa, toshino, and we'll get into examples of what that all means. So the first way that you can, you can tell the Filipino cuisine is breaking into more of a mainstream is when you see things that like, they're being used for tacos. So uh, at Booney Foods, and this is a revival food hall in Chicago, um, this is their sisik bomb tacos. They're calling these bomb tacos because they're huge. They make a, a wonderful big portion of these. Um, and we just love them. And it's just a great way to add Filipino kind of flair into your menu by doing something simple as a taco. Uh, and here they're uh, adding it with um, uh, calamansi citrus. Uh, they got adobo dip in the background. So adobo is, a, is, is basically a soy sauce and vinegar or citrus that's put together with some sort of chilies or sriracha or something like that you might have in the back of the house. Um, but just a great way to, to highlight Filipino cuisine really in a taco format. Again, here's their bomba tacos. So this is their longanista sausage that's pulled through here. They've got pickled papaya. And then uh, this is another example here. They've got a mushroom adobo salad. Uh, so that would be more of that vegetable play, but they actually take a, a, an egg and they cook that on top of the, the taco itself on the flat tops. So they're adding more uh, protein as well here. And you've got that calamansi um, uh, adobo dipping sauce in the background as well, which is a common theme. And then at Wake and Bacon, here's their adobo Philly dip. So, you know, a Philly cheese steak everybody's familiar with, but they're taking it and they're making it different with global flavor. So what they're adding is that adobo, uh, that dip in the background for that au jus, uh, which is the braising liquid that they have uh, from the chicken. And, you know, calling it a Philly, making it approachable to most consumers because everybody knows what a Philly is. But they're able to make it different by adding Filipino influence. And then also Wake and Bacon, here's their Ubi Flapjack stack. So again, adding that, that purple yam into the base of their flapjack batter, making it wonderful purple. And then, um, you know, the common things they're after, your, your eggs, your poached eggs. They've got wonderful, um, you know, sweet and spicy syrup there, uh, maple syrup to just to spoon over the top. 
And then their bacon flight. So we talked about Tocino. Tocino is an example of differentiation from a Filipino stance. And really, Tocino is more of a Spanish style um, way to make bacon, but it's often adopted in Filipino cuisine. So you're seeing it all over Filipino menus today. And that's really just with a natto seed. A natto seed is that red seed uh, that really makes you know things super red. So like their bacon, for example, they're doing it in house, they're smoking the bacon, they're putting a, a, a natto marinade over the top of it to cure it, and it makes it that wonderful red color. This is their bacon flight. And here's just an example from Kasama, lumpia that they're doing there. Again, that's another Filipino influence, egg rolls, spring rolls, things that are common on menus today all across the board, but it's doing it in a Filipino way to make it a little bit different. And then here's a breakfast sandwich at Kasama. Here the longanisa uh, sausage is uh, underneath the, all that American cheese uh, with an egg on top, super delicious and quick. And then here's their kind of bowl concept with some rice. You've got adobo marinated mushrooms, you've got a sunny side up egg on top of the rice. And then here's a wonderful sandwich that they did there. And again, here's another play. Uh, you know, you're, being in Chicago, you oftentimes get Italian beef. Here they're doing it in a Filipino way. They're doing it with pork. And then underneath it, it's hard to tell, um, but trust me, it's there. They've got um, the Tocino sausage and the longanisa that they make in house is all underneath uh, all that jardinera and all that shea pork. So you get the combo of all those meats um, and then there's a side component there of the jus that they kind of just drizzle over the top and it really just makes it one of the best actually Italian uh, beef sandwiches I've ever had, in this case is pork. And then just another bowl concept from a breakfast perspective here, they've got uh, both their meats again, the, the longanisa and the Tocino that they make in house. Um, that, that fried rice with the egg on top, just a wonderful dish there. And then beverages, right? So at Purple Haze, at Wake and Bacon, excuse me, this is their Purple Haze concoction. So adding that ube uh, flavor, that color uh, into their mix here with oat milk um, and just a, a shot of coffee that's in there as well. And then lastly, actually at Kasama, this is their calamansi lemonade. So calamansi, as I told you before, is that um, that citrus component, right? So that's the play on lemonade, but has such a unique flavor, being that tangerine kind of lime and uh, Meyer lemon kind of flavor that is so unique, a really easy way to make a lemonade and make it different. And then on to uh, functional foods, which I'll say is nutritious and delicious. So uh, a lot of things that we saw uh, through research uh, had a common thread of, for one, color. So visual cues that you know, drive, um, you know, craveability and appetite. And then these particular ingredients also had a whole host of nutritious backgrounds to them, why they're being used for oftentimes kind of breakfast or brunchy kind of items. And all these examples are truly portable. So um, consumers are gravitating towards these things because they're quick, they're grab and go concepts, they're oftentimes beverages, they're things that port really well, you can get in the morning and just get in and get out and just grab as you go to work. And so let's talk about some of those examples. And overnight oats certainly is not anything new, but I think what Uncooked was doing uh, from a concept perspective was making them unique with what they add for stirrings or, or color enhancers that are also like health benefits as well. So here, the, this is their blueberry overnight oats. So they've got uh, blueberries in there that are fresh, but they also have blueberry powder, and then they have blue spirulina um, to add you know, more nutrition to the background of it, um, some antioxidants as well. And uh, just a wonderful way to do overnight oats. It's something you can get a hat on in advance. They have this in a retail kind of case. You could walk in and just grab one. These are like eight ounce delis. And here they've got a couple different examples. We'll go through them, but really easy to get a hat on these things and to put out there for people to grab, put on your menu. Here they've got cold brew overnight oats. So if you're making cold brew already in house, use that as the way to hydrate your oats. You know, add some more caffeine to the mix. Um, you know, you could add you know, uh, peanut butter in here if you wanted to, all, all different sorts of things. I think the world is your oyster when you make overnight oats. So look at your larder or what you have in the back of the house and try to capitalize on those ingredients that you already have or you're using, like in this case, cold brew. And then here's chocolate overnight oats, right? So they're adding a little cacao powder or cacao nibs in there. And then they've got raspberries, um, chia seeds. So, you know, the, the chia seeds are getting hydrated as well, almost like you have for a chia pudding. Um, just unique ways to do oats, I think. Now, another bowl concept, right? So your kind of smoothie bowl concept. Uh, it's been around for a while, but the highlight, I think, for here is those ingredients that are being utilized. So pitaya or your dragon fruit, um, either from a fresh perspective or in powder format. If you buy the powder, it's super easy to add to smoothies that will make it wonderfully pink. Um, and here they're using raspberries for a reason to play on that color. But they're adding protein powder here for more health-driven ingredients. Um, bananas, they've got 
uh, blueberries, strawberries, right? All these wonderful things and textures on top. But the idea here is that most of these things are customizable as well. When you get into smoothies and smoothie bowls, there's ways to enhance and let the, the consumer drive what they want and also build what that price becomes, right? So more revenue generating there. Here's another uh, uh, smoothie bowl that's from Machacita in Chicago. This is uh, using pitaya as the base, that dragon fruit as well. So you can see the pink in the background. Um, they've got wonderful fresh fruits, as you can see here, some granola. They've got little flakes of coconut. Just a great, great dish. And then this is Wake and Bacon's Halo Halo Chia Chia. So we're all familiar with chia seed pudding at this point in time, but I like what they did because they used different ingredients to make it. And then whimsically, they put um, a little bit of cereal or Fruity Pebbles on top for texture. And also, it actually worked really well. Fruity Pebbles have that kind of gingery flavor to it. And obviously, it's sweet and it's got texture, but it just went really well when you mixed it all up together. That was a great dish. But they also have coconut jelly in there, right? So something different to make chia seed pudding just slightly unique. And then more into the beverage component side of things, right? So pitaya, like I talked about, dragon fruit powder in this case. Here they're just adding it to their, their uh, what they're calling their ice pink senorita latte, machacita. So just an easy way to use something like coconut milk and do a latte uh, iteration. Uh, also, they're using that blue spirulina that we talked about before in a powder format to make this latte. Super easy to do as well. And then getting into smoothies at Uncooked. Um, gosh, the ingredients that they have there uh, from a health-driven perspective are so cool. And what they're doing from a, a menu concept and making you know, their signature smoothies like this or being able to offer it as build your own or a plus one to add things into to customize. And I think that's key. So they're adding Irish moss here, MCT oil. Um, a lot of things that you would commonly see as health-driven ingredients here are now just being incorporated into smoothies. Also when uncooked, uh, on the retail side of things, they had a wonderful array of different beverages. There were just a few of them. So they're making cold brew. Like I said, if you're already making that in the back of the house, might as well put it in your overnight oats, right? So here they're using uh, mushrooms as functional ingredients. So lion's mane mushroom powder is in their cold brew for cognitive function. Um, they're adding um, oat milk a little bit in there, you know, instead of regular dairy milks. So they're appeasing all different sorts of consumers. Um, the black lemonade, activated charcoal powder, um, they've got the apple cider is more of a tonic, uh, which I think is great for gut health, right? Wonderful different beverages that they had in retail. Just grab and go, get ahead. And then back in Machacita, the activated charcoal comes again with their, with their matcha. So they've got a charcoal matcha latte. And then I love their little add-in to make it lucky with Lucky Charms on top. And then also back at Uncooked, that almighty smoothie. Here they're using acai. That super, uh, super fruit that's been around for a while. We've seen it in bowl formats. Here it's in the smoothie. Um, but again, they're adding all those wonderful ingredients. They're health-driven ingredients. So you've got ashwagandha in there. You've got almond milk, right? All these wonderful things you can put for health-driven ingredients. You know, this is something you can walk down the street, right? Obviously, you're walking to work. Really great, great, great way for breakfast to be able to implement that. And then matcha sita, obviously, it's matcha-focused as a, as a concept. Uh, but here they're using yuzu, that citrus as well, for lemon to make their lemonada, which I thought was brilliant. And then uh, uncooked that cleanse. So here using things like kale and apples to make their smoothie. Just a wonderful green color, lots of great flavor. And then their fuel. So avocado, cauliflower, kale, uh, some protein powder in that one. And then their glow. So mangoes, bananas, turmeric is that one there that is really driving that uh, influence for health-driven ingredients. So Turmeric obviously has a lot of great properties to it, like anti-inflammatories, among other things. And then in matcha cita, their ice purple haze latte. So they're adding CBD here um, to their latte. They're adding lavender. Um, just a wonderful way to make this purple and green kind of, you know, blend with their, with their latte. And then even a horchata makes an appearance into their, into their play with um, their matcha cita concept. So you've got ice matcha doing it in a horchata style. So cinnamon, vanilla, almond milk, that's a wonderful way there. And then you also have to think through even just some things you don't need to make, just adding beverages that you can purchase to put into your retail format or to offer on your menu that you know, isn't gonna drive any labor, uh, but also add intrigue or consumer demand. So one of those things easily is kombucha, right? It's been around a long time, but I just wanted to call it out here quickly. These are a couple that we had at Wake and Bacon. And then things like um, from Rishi, uh, these sparkling botanicals that are just super delicious. They're, uh, six different flavors here that we picked up on, on the retail side. Wonderful, wonderful um, botanicals, almost like tonics. I think they would easily double for a mocktail component if you wanted to at the bar, or even offering them up as a, 
just by itself is a mocktail because the ingredients in them are so wonderful and they have so much flavor. I thought they were really delicious. And that concludes our seminar for today. So thank you for your time and tuning in. Thank you for your business. And on behalf of the Gordon Food Service family, we wish you nothing but the best in your continued endeavors.